good day, everyone. On behalf of Cambridge Health Tech Institute's Breakout COVID-19 Global Web Symposia Series and our sponsor, Sinobiological, I'd like to welcome you to Multiplex Serological Assays for COVID-19. My name is Elizabeth Lamb, and I'm the technical director for today's event. Now I'd like to introduce our chairperson for today. He is Dr. Rob Burgess, PhD, Chief Business Officer with Sinobiological. Welcome, Dr. Burgess. The presenter ball is yours. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. And uh, as Elizabeth said, I'm Rob Burgess. I'm Chief Business Officer for Sinobiological. And I just want to officially welcome everyone to this online webinar series titled Multiplex Serological Assays for COVID-19. I specifically want to thank our speakers for their upcoming presentations today. And I also want to thank all the registered attendees for joining us today. So with that, I just want to mention that each speaker will have 15 minutes to give their presentation. And that will be followed by about a five minute question and answer session. And the way we're going to handle that is we would ask each individual in the audience, if you have a question, to type it into the chat panel. And then I'll review all of those questions towards the ends of the talk. And then I'll present that to the presenter, probably the top three or four questions and give them an opportunity to answer that. So that's the way we're gonna handle it. And again, I thank everybody for joining us today. So without further ado, I would like to introduce our first speaker, which is Dr. Michael Bush. Um, Dr. Bush earned his PhD and his MD degrees from the University of California uh, in University of, I'm sorry, University of Southern California, and he completed his residency training in pathology and laboratory medicine at the University of California, San Francisco. Dr. Bush is currently Director of Vitalant Research Institute and a Senior Vice President for Research and Scientific Affairs at Vitalant, which is a national network of blood centers and donor testing laboratories. I want to mention that Dr. Bush has also published over 500 peer-reviewed original scientific articles and over 150 review articles, editorials, and book chapters. And the title of Dr. Bush's talk today is The Application of SARS-CoV-2 SARS Serological Assays for Monitoring the Epidemic and Qualification of Donors and Plasma for Use as COVID-19 Convalescent Plasma. So thank you. And with that, Dr. Bush, I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, thank you, Rob. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Great. Okay, yeah. So I'm going to just run through uh, slides fairly briskly because uh, some of the slides I'll actually kind of just touch on because both Larry and Phil will talk in more detail about some of their technologies. Uh, but basically, this presentation is, is trying to kind of present a broad perspective on the applications and the limitations and, quotes, ab abuses of serologic testing and how these can be interpreted both at the individual level and scientific policymaker level, and particularly how they can be employed in serious surveillance um, testing. So uh, this, this list is uh, a partial list now as things evolve over time. Uh, of how these antibody tests are being used. They can clearly be uh, an asset in initial infection diagnosis, given the limited sensitivity of swab-based testing uh, over the period of, of symptomatic presentation. Um, they can be used to screen asymptomatic populations, uh, healthcare workers, first responders, the concept of testing people to get them back to work. Uh, you can qualify convalescent plasma or hyperimmune globulin donors, uh, and, and this is a major application that I'll touch on, and I think Larry will present a fair bit about. Uh, they can be used in large-scale serosurveillance studies, and a number of serologic uh, studies have been executed, and uh, very few have been published. There's a number of sort of preliminary uh, reports and, and uh, lay press reports, but uh, I'd caution that a lot of the serosurveillance data that has been promulgated is uh, is questionable in, in terms of accuracy, often based on point of care rapid tests that uh, I'll not talk about because um, my focus and, and much of our work employs lab-based antibody assays. And those serologic um, tests that are point of care have proven to have high false positive rates and uh, FDA has actually reversed the policies that allowed those to be used and ported. Um, 
The durability of immunity is a critical question that's going to have to be studied over the next several years, but obviously measuring over time the antibody levels and the neutralization potency of those antibodies is going to be very important to inform the question of protective immunity, both at the individual and population, so-called herd immunity level. Um, we can also use antibodies as a, as a tool to measure reinfections because boosting of immunity is probably our best indicator of a, of a reinfection by SARS-CoV-2. So there's a number of studies that are being considered that are looking at longitudinal populations uh, and then also cross-sectional populations to understand rates of reinfection. And then as vaccines become available, we need antibody tests to measure vaccine efficacy uh, and to potentially detect vaccine breakthrough infections, potentially targeting uh, non-envelope antibodies. So the current uh, vaccines are all based on spike uh, protein antibodies, so we can target uh, nucleocapsid antibodies to, uh, to detect that, uh, those other, um, other infections. Uh, and then just to make the point that, that all of these different, if you will, use cases uh, may require different types of assays. So again, there's point of care assays versus lab-based tests. Um, the antigen represented ranges from nucleocapsid to various uh, configurations of spike antigens. The format of the tests as to whether they detect IgM, IgG, IgA, or a combination of all those antibodies is important. Um, again, the value of confirmation testing, uh, characterization assays, and Phil will talk quite a bit about a, a beautiful test that he's developed. And then neutralizing potency of these antibodies. So we can both screen for binding antibodies, which are done on high throughput platforms, but then we have to, um, in many studies, characterize the neutralization potency of those assays using either classic plaque reduction neutralization tests or other tests that I'll, I'll touch on. So this is, I'm not gonna to speak to this, but this is just to point you to a recent review in JAMA on interpreting diagnostic tests. And it, it focuses both on the molecular tests for swabs uh, and then on how antibody detection serves as an adjunct for acute diagnosis. So just points you to this citation. Um, these are assays that we're currently studying, uh, lab-based assays that have uh, different representation. These are the big companies that we often hear about, know about. Um, that are commercialized. Most of these are or are pending emergency use authorization from FDA. And you can see that they have a diverse array of, of represent, represented antigens in the second column, um, either the S1 portion of the spike protein, or in some cases, the S1 and S2, um, or the nucleocapsid proteins. And they range from assays such as the total Ig antigen sandwich configuration, to antibody tests that are indirect uh, antibody assays that can detect it, uh, specifically the IgM or IgG or IgA responses. One of the tests that we've done a lot on, just as an illustration, is the ortho vitreous total Ig assay. It's a test that we've scaled up in our testing laboratories and are using in our large serous surveys as well as for convalescent plasma. And this is based on the antigen sandwich configuration that I alluded to, the so-called third generation. The, um, the upper left uh, figure, uh, which is from the instructions for use that's posted at the FDA website, uh, describes the, uh, the uh, configuration that allows this test to very sensitively detect IgM, IgA, or IgG. Uh, I won't go through these details, but this is a very high throughput platform, and we have two of these in my lab in San Francisco, and we now have 10 of these, two each in our five uh, creative testing solution laboratories. So very high throughput and the company just in the course of a month has scaled up from uh, 300,000 to over 5 million tests available during May. Um, this is the specificity data in the lower left corner from the, from the package insert or instructions for use. So this is uh, a very nice evidence of, of specificity with negative uh, serum or plasma samples having very low level reactivity relative to the cutoff. And then on the right, you can see the, um, the sensitivity data. So these are 69 confirmed infected people. Samples are uh, plotted by days since onset of symptoms and showing that uh, there are some early samples collected in the first week after onset that are PCR positive, that are negative for antibodies. So this is pre-seroconversion. Those were all neutralization negative. But beyond eight days, 100% of samples had antibody. And there's a wide range of antibody reactivity above the cutoff up to as high as 300. 
This is longitudinal data. Um, this is data from uh, colleagues of collaboration with my team and UCSF, just looking at the Abbott test. So the Abbott has uh, both an EUA for their IgG and their IgM assays. And you can see if you have clinical patients in the hospital, they're seroconverting briskly within a week, uh, on average uh, about 12 days of, of time from onset of symptoms to seroconversion. So, and then this assay um, peaks out at around six um, indices units. So it plateaus um, fairly briskly after seroconversion. And on the right, on the upper uh, quadrant I uh, panel, you can see these neutralization antibodies are coming up simultaneously with the uh, antibodies to seroconversion. This is something we could perhaps talk about later. And similar to the earlier slide in the lower portion here, the, the sensitivity of these tests are for acute infection are contingent on the time from in, infection onset and, and symptom onset. So if you, again, are, are collecting samples within days of symptom onset, half of them will be negative for antibody, but beyond a, a week or so, the vast majority are positive. This is an example of a neutralization test. Uh, no detail, uh, time for detail, but basically what, what's been done is to incorporate into a pseudovirus, uh, what's called a pseudovirus, the SARS-CoV-2 envelope protein, the native trimer confirmation. And this pseudovirus is a single round reporter virus that, um, that inside the virus has a genome that will, uh, that will, when it enters a cell, result in that cell either fluorescing green or emitting luciferase light. And you can then measure the ability of a patient's serum to inhibit that, um, that virus from entering a cell through the receptor that's been engineered into the target cells, the ACE2 receptor. And you can generate titers. And at the lower right are examples of convalescent plasma that's been donated. Uh, and you can see that there's one example that's a flat line. That's a sample that at all dilutions starting at 1 to 40, 1 to 120, et cetera, are negative. Um, whereas most of these samples so, show nice dilution uh, sensitivity ranging from uh, NT50s, neutralization titers 50, uh, of, of as high as, as thousands to as low as, as 40. This is Phil's essay. I'm not going to spend any time on it. It's just part of this slideshow. I, I'll let him, uh, him expound in great detail on this beautiful test. Um, I just want to share a, a large study that's been launched. Um, it's a sero incident study, and it gets us into the application of these tests uh, for uh, surveillance. So we are, as part of this new CDC-funded program, we have uh, launched uh, in an initial phase uh, from NIH-funded activities, but now as a CDC-funded program, a large program that will, over the next 18 months, test 325,000 uh, representative blood donations collected from 25 regions around the country. And as a first aim of this project, we're actually uh, evaluating the performance of, of 10 lab-based assays. Um, we expect them to perform well for this purpose because the goal is to validate that they can detect antibody after full maturation of antibody from convalescent plasma donors. Uh, but then this program will continue for 18 months to track the outbreak around the country in, in metropolitan regions. Uh, and will include a follow-up of 150 of these convalescent plasma donors to quantify the immunity over time, which is a key question around protection from reinfection, but also we need to understand the waning of antibodies to, uh, to be able to fully interpret serosurveillance data. And this is the putative locations. The, uh, the regions in red here have actually already started collecting and testing samples uh, and for antibodies. Um, these are part of the NIH uh, response program. And then we're adding uh, additional 19 regions that will uh, be uh, decided on finally over the next um, six, uh, six weeks or so. This just contrasts the antibody signal that we see uh, with routine blood donations on the left. This is a sample of 500 from New York, where you can see that there are, I think, seven or eight strongly reactive, uh, a lot of them negative, and a few just below the cutoff. Those couple just below the cutoff in the serial surveillance were real. When we retested them with neutralization and the orthoassay, they were at the cutoff and, and did neutralize. So for purposes of a serial survey, you might even use a lower cutoff or a gray zone. In contrast, on the right is the reactivity of donors coming back to provide convalescent plasma. And you can see that the vast majority of these donors have very strong uh, signal intensity, 
Um, there are some that are negative, uh, and, and we were surprised by this. These are people who allegedly were sick, but what we're discovering is that some people were misdiagnosed or rarely people may fail to seroconvert following particularly asymptomatic infections. And then just another example of a sero surveillance um, activity. This is San Francisco, again, looking at clinical patients with COVID-19, and then some convenient samples from the hospital, just discarded um, hematology lab samples or blood donor samples um, at, with rare positivity. These neutralization titers do correlate with the signal intensity of the screening assay. Uh, this is shown here uh, as a graph, highly statistically significant, but not a perfect correlation by any means. But based on these kinds of data, we're actually now moving to a policy to release convalescent plasma for transfusion. It's being tested in parallel with all the other donor tests. And if the signal intensity is at least 10, then we're confident that the neutralization titers would be at least 1 to 40, generally 1 to 160, and potent for transfusion. So this has now been, this kind of analysis has been the basis for setting a threshold for immediate release. And the samples that fall below a cutoff of, a single cutoff of 10 are, are taken on to neutralization testing. And then just in closing, just to make a couple points and then final limitations. So in common coronaviruses, studies were done where you infected people purposely uh, in, in research protocols. These are benign cold viruses. And you can see how the people seroconvert both a binding and a neutralizing antibody, and then the antibodies wane on the left. And that's what we're expecting to see in SARS-CoV-2. Um, on the right are actually rechallenge studies where people were infected again uh, about a year to year and a half after they were initially infected and the immunity had waned, they were susceptible to reinfection by the same virus and the antibodies boosted. So this is an illustration of how these antibody tests can be used to measure for reinfections in, in large populations. I'm gonna skip this slide and just um, just cl close with two, two slides. One, just uh, recent publications from colleagues in, in both the Netherlands and Denmark showing that uh, that you can use donor-based serosurveys to estimate population incidence rates. So in Denmark, they derived an estimate of overall 4.2% of the donor population extrapolated to the general population was thought to be seropositive based on a very good uh, lab assay. Uh, varying rates across the country, you can see in the map on the right, and that lower right portion of the Netherlands is not dense population areas like Amsterdam. It's actually places where there were large uh, like uh, uh, events, uh, social events, uh, carnivals, things like that, that led to lots of people getting together at the wrong time and a lot of infection. And the Danish group um, actually extrapolated from the donor data to estimate that 82 people died for every 100,000 infections. So we're now, by doing these large scale zero surveys, we're now able to get the true denominator of number of people infected to correlate with the um, with the case rate reported and the death rate. And then finally, limitations. So I've touched on this, but uh, we've got to make sure we don't have false positive results. And that it requires using specific, and our preference is lab-based antibody tests and confirmation algorithms. Uh, we can't rule out infection in recently exposed people or symptomatic people with antibody tests because you can uh, take a week or 10 days to seroconvert and, and be uh, positive by PCR, so it's not a standalone diagnostic. Um, the variability of antibody dynamics uh, is such that, uh, that, that we, uh, we can't, probably can't date infections, uh, and, and we need to be careful about the role of past arbovirus infections on influencing the antibody dynamics. And again, Phil will touch on that. Uh, we can't infer that just because people have antibody that they're protected from reinfections or how durable that protection will be. Uh, relevant to the individual and herd immunity questions. Uh, and again, as with many other viruses, uh, the slide I skipped was an example of Zika, but we've seen this with chikungunya, with many, many acute viral infections, the immunity wanes over time. And so we're expecting that to occur um, in, in people who are infected with SARS-CoV-2 and need to monitor that through longitudinal samples. Uh, and then as vaccines become available, we need to make sure we have tests that can detect vaccine-induced seropositivity and discriminate that from natural infections and, and, uh, and also optimally boost, boost immunity using vaccines to sustain a population of people who are both individually immune and good sources for 
uh, using convalescent plasma or hyperimmune globulin. And then finally, just to mention, there is new data showing that this virus, although genetically uh, and antigenically quite stable, uh, historically, <laughs> since it started uh, six months ago, uh, there is now evidence that there are some mutations that are beginning to be fixed in the population that either increase or reduce pathogenicity and infectivity. Um, I don't think these mutations will influence antibody tests or molecular diagnostic test performance, but it's something that we need to keep our eye on. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Dr. Bush, for an excellent presentation. We really appreciate it. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to go ahead and jump right to the questions. And I've, I've had a number of individuals ask what I would consider a very general question, just kind of wanted to get your opinion more than anything. And I think this is related to lab-based serological assays, but also maybe the lateral flow on-site type of assays, the yes or no type of kits. Why is it that so many of these tests for COVID-19 are inaccurate? And uh, could you give your opinion on what is possibly the best laboratory-based um, test or platform? Yeah, those are good questions, but sensitive questions. <laughs> so <laughs> I'll make uh, I'll make a couple Try comments. That. Again, FDA uh, you know, initially uh, allowed a lot of tests to be distributed without any requirement for submission of pre-reviewed data. And that led to an influx of a large number of imported assays, particularly these uh, lateral flow assays like home pregnancy tests that theoretically could detect IgM or IgG and maybe even have a control band. But many of them were, were simply inaccurate. If you, if you even look at the company's uh, stated false positive rates, they could be up as high as five or 10% and sensitivities as low as 80%. So, and really no strong data to support any claim. So FDA has subsequently reversed that policy and required that antibody tests go through pre-review and, and emergency use authorization. So that's uh, resulted in a dramatic change in the landscape over the last um, six months. And I think there may be again about 10 or 12 lab-based assays that are uh, now EUA authorized, and all of them, I think, are, are very good tests, some slightly better than others. I'm not going to get into uh, ranking them at this point. We're doing a study to evaluate that. Um, I think there may be a couple of point-of-care assays um, from well-established large commercial manufacturers of point-of-care tests that use automated readers as opposed to eye reading, trying to see a, a weak band on a strip. So th that big distinction of, of lab-based assays, which I am a strong advocate of and uh, versus point of care, which there is a role for, but, but I think those tests that, that um, are approved uh, hopefully will be used appropriately and, and interpreted appropriately. Great, thank you, Dr. Bush. And one quick technical question somebody had asked is, the assays that you mentioned in your presentation, do they contain negative controls for non-COVID-19 related coronaviruses that would include like the N or the spike protein? Yeah, so they, they don't include, uh, if you will, bands that would detect those other viruses. And again, Phil, Phil will speak to this, but importantly, we have, working with Phil, provided the federal government, including the FDA, with, with lots of samples that we know have those other antibodies uh, mm -hmm. by using the array that Phil will describe. And so that allows the companies to verify that their assays are specific for SARS-CoV. Um, many of these assays will cross-react. If a person had SARS-CoV-1, they would look as if they had SARS-CoV-2 because it binds to the same region. So there, there, as Phil will show, there's some cross-reactivity within that, those novel coronaviruses, but that's really not relevant because those viruses, uh, SARS-CoV-1, are, are no longer circulating. So I think that the, the companies have had to demonstrate that they do not have false positive results due to common coronaviruses and other respiratory pathogens. Great, good point. Thank you, Dr. Bush, and thanks for the great questions from our attendees. I think in the interest of time, we'll move on to our next speaker, which is Dr. Larry Korosh. A little bit about Dr. Korosh's background. Dr. Korosh is Senior Vice President and Chief Scientific Officer at Cirrus Corporation which is a company that he founded back in 1992. He is also professor of laboratory medicine at the University of California, San Francisco, 
And it's here that he served for 15 years as the chief of clinical laboratory hematology service. So he's published almost 200 original research papers in peer reviewed journals in the field of hematology and transfusion medicine. Dr. Koras graduated from NYU with, uh, for his degree and completed internal medicine training at Bellevue Hospital, also in New York. And I wanna emphasize also that he leads the Convalescent Plasma for Emerging Pathogens Consortium. And he is the developer of the Intercept Pathogen Inactivation System for the preparation of platelets and plasma. So with that, uh, I will give the title of Dr. Koresh's talk as well, which is the Optimized Development of Pathogen Inactivated COVID-19 Convalescent Plasma. So Dr. Koresh, thank you for joining us today and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you and uh, thanks to everybody for joining this uh, interesting seminar. Um, blood transfusion safety is really a global problem. Approximately five new viruses are discovered each year that impact blood donors somewhere in the world. And as we've experienced over the last decade, many of these can become uh, epidemic and pandemic. And SARS-CoV-2 is our uh, most recent problem on a very large scale. So what's the rationale for convalescent plasma therapy? Well, it goes back a long way, all the way to the uh, Spanish uh, flu epidemic of 1918. But the idea is to use antibodies that are in uh, plasma of recovered individuals to be transfused to neutralize virus, to prevent disease progression. And our strategy is to treat early because we want to avoid progression to ventilators and the use of intensive care resources. Now, there are many potential mechanisms of action in this plasma. It's not just the antibodies that might neutralize virus, but there are also a host of immunomodulatory effects that people are beginning to observe. Uh, the ability to basically uh, neutralize pro-inflammatory cytokines, uh, activated complement, and to uh, impact basically uh, adaptive immunity uh, by uh, decreasing cytokine storm and shifting to more uh, suppressive environments in these patients. So there are multiple potential benefits for the convalescent plasma. Now, one should always have a hypothesis to test, and ours is does optimized convalescent plasma avoid disease progression and improve survival? So uh, this is a very interesting hypothesis from a recent paper that uh, by he and all, who uh, basically identified the uh, pericyte cell as the important cell in impacting uh, morbidity and potentially mortality of SARS-CoV-2 infection. This is a cell that lies outside of the endothelial layer and in patients with certain pre-morbid conditions like diabetes and hypertension, they may have looser junctions that allow access of the virus to these cells, and that then potentiates a cycle of increasing uh, potentiation of infection by the virus. And we've seen in these patients that they also have abnormalities in their coagulation systems, with D-dimer levels increased, telling us that thrombin has been active, that platelets are moderately decreased, they have thrombotic events, they have pulmonary capillary leak, and we've seen in many of these patients depression of T-cell counts indicative of uh, acquired adaptive immune deficiency. So why is convalescent plasma urgently needed and why should it be pathogen inactivated? Well, first of all, pandemics are always unexpected and diagnostic and therapeutic resources are always limited. Convalescent plasma containing antibodies is a readily available therapy. It's FDA approved as pathogen inactivated plasma in the United States and Europe. It's rapidly deployable in a distributed format from blood centers. And recovered patients as convalescent plasma donors are motivated donors to help others with the same disease. But why should it be pathogen inactivated to be optimal? 
Well, convalescent plasma donors are not normal blood donors, and many of them are first-time donors that we know carry higher risks. COVID-19 patients have damaged immune and vascular systems, and they're more vulnerable to blood-borne infections. And we don't know for sure, but there could be residual SARS-CoV-2 in donor plasma. We think not, but there's always that possibility. Due to antibody diversity in plasma, a pool of convalescent plasmas may be more effective, and pathogen inactivation reduces the risk of transfusion-transmitted infections when you have pooled blood products. As I said before, the intercept pathogen inactivated plasma has been in use in the EU since 2005 approved by FDA in 2014. It has established therapeutic efficacy for congenital and acquired bleeding disorders, and it has a favorable benefit to risk profile. The mechanism of action is basically using nucleic targeted photochemistry, a compound which is a sorol and is added to the blood component. It intercalates and then is activated by UVA light to cross-link nucleic acids, and that gives you an activation of infectious agents, as well as T cells. It's provided to blood centers in a series of plastic containers in an integrated closed system with a benchtop illumination device to deliver the UVA light in a three to five minute treatment process. It's been through multiple regulatory approvals all over the world, and so this provides, I think, to the end users uh, confidence in the safety and the efficacy of this plasma. The working party on uh, global blood safety, which is led by Jay Epstein and Terry Bernouf, issued a recent report encouraging the use of pathogen inactivated uh, plasma for convalescent plasma. So is it efficacious? Well, this is an interesting CT image from a recent paper by Duan, and where you see uh, on this image of the lungs, the red arrows are showing you classical uh, SARS-CoV-2 or COVID-19 uh, pneumonic lesions in the lungs, and after convalescent plasma, they cleared. So we see some evidence here of, of, of efficacy. We have been involved in a preliminary uh, clinical experience at the University of Basel uh, in Switzerland. Uh, they've been our early users of pathogen-reduced uh, convalescent plasma. They've treated 13 patients. They've used 400 mils per day for two days. Their strategy was to prevent progression to the ventilator. And so they treated early after hospital admission. They always used four different donors in this plasma uh, administration to achieve antibody diversity. 12 of their 13 patients have survived. The one patient who unfortunately died was a patient who was admitted to them in cardiogenic shock, and so not the typical patient that they were targeting. There was a recent report that many of you have seen in JAMA showing that treatment of five critically ill patients on ventilators also demonstrated clinical efficacy. As Mike noted, uh, we formed a, a consortium here in California to optimize this therapy. Our objective was to basically characterize pathogen inactivated convalescent plasma and measure neutralizing antibody levels. And uh, particularly because of the acquired adaptive immune deficiency in these patients. Ultimately, we seek to leverage this into a platform and develop a lyophilized plasma product with convalescent characteristics for long-term strategy. We use a parallel effort where we go fast to clinic, but take our data and optimize um, production. And we do that through the series of assays that I'll show you on the next few slides. So as Mike Bush showed you, we characterize neutralization using the reporter virus neutralization assay. And what you do see here is the effects pre and post pathogen inactivation that shows us that there is conservation of neutralizing activity. And we have one plasma in green, which has no neutralizing activity from a recovered plasma donor. 
when we use a second assay that looks at agglutination uh, dependent antibody with PCR. Uh, this is an assay coming from Enable Bioscience using a soluble ACE2 receptor as the target. Again, we see confirmation in three different plasmas that pathogen reduction technology does not change the activity. This is data from Phil Feldner, which he's going to elaborate on. And the bottom message here is that looking at a protein chip array assay, we're able to show minimal impact of the intercept pathogen inactivation technology on affinity for these various antigenic targets. And so we find excellent correlation pre and post pathogen inactivation. That further reinforces our confidence in this technology. The heat map confirms the same thing, although we do find that 10% of patients have low uh, SARS-CoV-2 reactive antibodies. And so we know there are differences among different donors. This is the ADAP assay, which uses a clever technology with a DNA barcode to look at different epitopes. And it's shown very high sensitivity and specificity. It's shown sensitivity of 100% to detect antibody in recovered patients and with a uh, specificity of 99%, again, with very good correlation pre and post pathogen inactivation treatment. So in summary, a national platform is needed to enable rapid production of optimized pathogen inactivated convalescent plasma, not only for this epidemic and this pandemic, but for future ones by using a platform. There is a national program that so far 16,000 patients have been transfused in this program. But if you look at the scope of this pandemic, we've had 1.7 million cases and 100,000 deaths. And so we need to keep going so that we can have a resource to treat more patients. And lastly, thanks to my colleagues of the CPEP team, uh, some of whom you're hearing on this call for uh, their contributions to this collaborative program. And with that, I'll stop and entertain time for questions. Dr. Koresh, great talk. We appreciate it. I can tell you we got a ton of questions while you were speaking. So I'll jump right into some of the more interesting ones. The first question is, what about potential antibody-dependent enhancement, and can it be avoided in convalescent plasma? This is an important question, and we use actually the ADAP assay to look at this and so far, we have not seen evidence of antibody-dependent enhancement, but we are continuing to test our samples to ensure that we're not seeing that. Okay, thank you. And just a very general question, um, is there any cytotoxicity observed when you administer the plasma? No, uh, this plasma has had a very good safety profile. It's been in use in Europe uh, for over 10 years and is now being launched in the United States. Uh, we previously used it actually in a, uh, the Ebola outbreak and we made convalescent plasma from recovered Ebola patients and transfused it. And we saw a very good tolerance for this product. So uh, thus far, we have not seen any exceptional uh, adverse events other than the typical ones associated with allogeneic plasma of minor uh, urticaria, occasional fever, no hemolysis if you observe the correct uh, blood group matching protocols. Great, great. And then one final quick question, and I'm not familiar with this term, but um, is this convalescent plasma suitable for what's called passive transfer? Yes, I think it is. I think that once we establish uh, the efficacy in these patients to show that we can uh, basically prevent disease progression, I think that we should start to entertain. And in fact, there are some clinical trials that are running, I believe one from Columbia University in New York that would look at convalescent plasma in high risk individuals to give passive immunity. And that would be of course helpful before we get a vaccine that would be available particularly if we're going to get a recurrence or surge of this pandemic uh, in the coming flu season. 
Great, great answer. Thank you, Dr. Corris, for an excellent talk and great feedback. And with that, we will move on to our final speaker, last but certainly not least, I would like to introduce to the audience, Dr. Phil Feldner. Dr. Feldner is director of the UCI Vaccine Research and Development Center in the Protein Microarray Laboratory and Training Facility. This laboratory developed a high throughput approach, clone and express all proteins encoded in a microorganism's genomic DNA and then print them on corresponding protein microarrays. That's a huge technological feat. Dr. Feldner joined the faculty at UC Irvine in 2002 after two decades of experience in the biotech industry, including in which he founded the company Bicow, which is based in San Diego. And this founding was based on his discovery of DNA vaccines and he currently serves as a chief scientific officer to help build the company into a publicly traded company. He discovered and developed the lipofection DNA transfection technology in 1985, which actually many of us have used directly, myself included. And it's a very widely used approach for introducing nucleic acids into cultured cells. Dr. Feldner has published over 200 peer-reviewed research papers and has 45 issued patents that have been cited by many other scientists, resulting in the founding of other companies such as Antigen Discovery. So Dr. Feldner's title of his talk is Analysis of SARS-CoV-2 Antibodies in COVID-19 Convalescent Plasma Using a Coronavirus Antigen Microarray. So Dr. Feldner, I'll turn it over to you. Uh, thank you very much for that uh, nice introduction. To introduce the uh, microarray platform that we've been developing here uh, at UCI. Uh, this is an example of a protein microarray that we constructed actually many years ago. It's uh, a plasmodium falciparum protein microarray that has 4,000 proteins on this array. Uh, to get a perspective, size perspective, this uh, array it has, is about the size of your thumbnail. And uh, we can put 4,000 different proteins on uh, this array, different antigens from uh, encoded by the genome of the, the parasite and uh, probe the array with either samples from a naive a person uh, living in the United States or from uh, an individual in a uh, resident of uh, an African endemic area. The assay is really very simple. The proteins are printed on a nitrocellulose pad. We uh, put the uh, patient's serum sample on, the antibodies find the antigen target, and then we use a uh, fluorescent secondary antibody to, tech, to detect the binding of the primary antibody to the antigen. And what you can see from the array is that a naive person has very little reactivity against uh, many of these, any of these antigens. And the uh, person who's naturally exposed has a tremendous amount of uh, a diverse antibody profile against actually 1,000 uh, antigens. How we uh, go about uh, printing, uh, producing these arrays, uh, at the beginning, uh, some 20 years ago, when we uh, started this, there was very little content. There were genes, but there were uh, uh, gene sequences, but there were no ways, uh, convenient ways to make uh, hundreds or thousands of uh, genes and expressing the, them. So we de developed a uh, high throughput cloning method in our lab that allowed us to uh, clone 384 genes from genomic template uh, using PCR primers to amplify each gene. And uh, the, when the genes uh, were cloned into a, an expression vector, we could add that expression vector to a cell-free system, cell-free in vitro uh, uh, expression system, and produce the protein actually in a four-hour reaction. These uh, reactions are run in uh, 384-well plates, and a source plate is uh, placed on a microarray printer. And uh, we uh, obtain 
microscope slides that have a coating of nitrocellulose on the microscope slides and can use the microarray printer to um, print the, the chips. Our capacity in our facility right now is 4,800 arrays per day. Uh, the printers print over a million spots a day. And uh, it only takes 10 micrograms of protein to print that many arrays. Once we have the arrays printed, we can uh, use one microliter of a blood sample and probe 500 samples a day. So there's uh, throughput. Underneath, uh, I've added the inventory of genes and proteins that we printed so far. Um, we've uh, produced uh, protein microarrays with 60,000 different proteins on them now uh, against the 38 different infectious agents we printed. Now it's well over 40,000 arrays and our, our uh, freezers have more than 25,000 serum samples from all over the world, uh, cases and controls from all these different infections. So that's the way we've uh, done this up to now, but things are changing. Uh, today, uh, we can uh, do gene synthesis and, and quickly synthesize any kind of gene and put it in any kind of expression system. And uh, uh, purified proteins are becoming more and more available. Um, and a few years ago, we, we started to collaborate with uh, Sinobiologicals as a source of, of purified proteins. Uh, we have a uh, influenza array that we developed and studied uh, uh, for uh, vaccine purposes. And uh, we found uh, when the coronavirus uh, outbreak uh, emerged that we had a relevant protein microarray for that purpose as well. So on the left, uh, we're, we're obtaining purified proteins now, but the, the right-hand side of this figure, uh, we're still doing uh, pretty much the same way uh, in our laboratory now. So this is a, a, a diagram of how the serological testing is performed. After we print the chip, uh, we, we can use uh, frames and add sera into the to the wells over each array. Uh, typically, we have one microscope slide holds, uh, has uh, 16 arrays on it, so we can uh, probe 16 different uh, patient samples. Uh, this is the, the method, and uh, we, have a, we have to have an imager for this, and I'll tell you a little bit about uh, advanced imaging system that we're developing. This is the coronavirus uh, antigen microarray, we call it now, COVAM. It has 66 antigens printed in quadruplicate on the array. And uh, the, there's seven uh, SARS-CoV-2 antigens. The next generation has 11 uh, different SARS-CoV-2 uh, antigens on it. There's uh, SARS and MERS antigens and also common coronavirus and 34 other uh, uh, antigens from other respiratory infections that people commonly get during the, the flu season. They're, they're listed here. When we do a large collection of specimens, uh, usually the first look is a heat map. And uh, the heat map shows all the different antigens on the left-hand side, uh, the SARS-CoV-2, SARS, -CoV -2, SARS and MERS and, uh, and then influenza adenovirus and uh, RSV. Uh, when it's a red color, it means there's a lot of antibody. And when it's a pale uh, gray color, it means there's not much antibody. So the first thing we, we noticed from uh, probing this array uh, is how negative uh, a population of uh, uh, people are ha ha from uh, collected last year before the outbreak. So there's very little uh, background reactivity in the naive population from last year. And that kind of uh, predicts how uh, serious the infection is right now, because nobody's prepared with antibodies to fight this uh, infection when it appears. 
Uh, you also can uh, notice that there are a lot of uh, antibody against the more seasonal uh, flu and, and other respiratory infections and including uh, seasonal uh, common coronavirus has a lot of reactivity. That, but we have uh, reactivity uh, against the common coronaviruses, but they're not really cross-reacting uh, to the novel coronaviruses. That's uh, one of the takeaways from this uh, image. The other thing uh, to notice is that when you have confirmed positive cases, they react to the SARS-CoV-2. Another way to represent this data is in uh, bar graphs like this. You can see the, the antigens listed along the x-axis here. And uh, these are the average reactivities of uh, 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 samples from uh, uh, confirmed positive cases. Uh, and, and you can see there's not too much difference between the COVID cases and, uh, and uh, other, um, uh, other individuals that are not infected against the, the other common uh, respiratory infections. And uh, though a lot of our work has been done to uh, measure differences in groups, you know, groups of infected people or uh, healthy people. But uh, for a test uh, like this, we, we have to think more about what is going to, what kind of an individual report it will a person get to inform them about their status, their serological status. So we uh, developed a report like this. It's, uh, it's quite a bit more informative than the usual Yes, you're infected. No, you're not. Um, you know, we, we have a number of antigens here uh, that, uh, uh, in this case, the, it's a report from a naive person who's not infected. So the antigens up on top here, um, uh, there's uh, none of them are reactive. Um, and uh, when you, you go, though, to a uh, an individual who is infected, you can see the reactivity. Uh, they are above the reactivity threshold for um, a number of the, the antigens. And so this is what a, an individual, the kind of a report that an individual would uh, be able to access to understand the, their exposure. And to zoom in on this a little bit more, these are the all of the antigens, the common uh, flu antigens, and um, that the naive individuals have uh, le less little reactivity to the uh, novel coronavirus antigens, but the infected uh, individuals do. And um, to um, uh, reduce this to uh, sensitivity and specificity. Uh, we can combine uh, numerous antigens together, not just look at a single antigen, but do a multi-antigen uh, classification and get uh, sensitivity and specificity for this test at 100% uh, specificity and 95% uh, uh, sensitivity. And we've done these uh, separately for IgG and IgM because the IgM can be uh, an earlier uh, indicator of infection uh, compared to IgG. Um, so to get this um, more widely, this uh, more widely accessible outside of our laboratory. One of the bottlenecks has been the uh, ability to measure the arrays. And uh, the original technology they used a laser scanner. It takes about 10 minutes to scan one slide. It weighs 100 pounds, it's, and it's uh, not portable. Uh, we collaborated with uh, another business, uh, Grace Biolabs, and they developed a camera system that uh, instead of taking 10 minutes, it could take one minute and it was more portable. Uh, but uh, our group here uh, has developed a camera based, uh, cell phone based uh, system. Uh, we're calling it the tiny imager. It takes one second to take an image 
and it's uh, less than uh, a pound and it's portable. It's a familiar um, screen here from a cell phone that can capture the image. So the, the, uh, the concept uh, of this is that we do our, our probing the usual way we do on the lab bench, but the results get uh, uh, appear on the, on the microarray. We can take a picture of the microarrays and then send the image uh, up to the cloud where the an analysis of the image is accomplished and then the results can be uh, sent, sent back to the, the uh, donor of the sample. And this, uh, these results here are just to show that the results we get with the tiny imager are the same as the results uh, we achieve with the, the usual uh, laboratory uh, instrument. Um, and this, uh, this uh, slide just confirms the same thing that the array cam imager produces the same and the tiny image array imager produce the same uh, equivalent results. Uh, the, the, we're also transferring this into a CLIA setting. We have a, a, a CLIA laboratory that we're collaborating with and they are reaching out to and developing a uh, application to the FDA for CLIA uh, certification, CLIA waiver. And uh, we're targeting uh, about two to three weeks uh, from the time of submission here uh, for uh, hopefully to get uh, a waiver for this. This is not too unfamiliar. Uh, you know, instead of using a handheld pipetter, uh, we can put the, uh, the array system on a, uh, a 96 well plate format and use robotics to uh, probe the arrays. And uh, the other feature is that the camera, the tiny array imager will be a camera on a robotic arm so that uh, the images can be uh, take, taken individually, each array. And the arrays are actually going to be not on microscope slides, but on a, a plate of 96 arrays. And this, Im this information will likewise be transmitted up to the cloud where it'll be processed. And finally, we have activity uh, developing a point of care device. Uh, this was a, is a sponsored project now with Sensor Kinesis and a collaboration with the Mark Madu Lab. Uh, this is technology that we've actually already proven uh, from a collaboration uh, about 10 years ago. Um, it uh, involves uh, using finger stick blood so we don't need to use a phlebotomist to collect the blood. And uh, the development of these arrays is within 10 minutes. It's the same speed as the uh, lateral flow um, test would be. And the results are quantified, uh, like um, actually Mike uh, brought up that, that there's some of the lateral flow uh, tests are now quantifiable and that makes them uh, more accurate. And this is also quantified in a, in a similar way. So in summary, um, the, uh, uh, we have a, a finger stick uh, co blood collection approach. It avoids venous blood draws, doesn't require phlebotomists. We found we were able to collect in the hospital a thousand specimens in three days uh, from the hospital with, with six uh, uh, medical student volunteers doing the collections. Um, we are in a, a three weeks or so, we're gonna start a Orange County Community uh, a survey uh, collecting 5,000 specimens, about 1,000 a week for uh, a few weeks. And um, we're probing vaccine specimens in, in clinical trials uh, we're applying for a CLIA waiver uh, and we're developing a, a, a point of care device for this technology. 
So um, with, with that, um, the, these are my uh, collaborators and uh, lab members, and I'll, I'll take any questions if we still have some time. Thank you, Dr. Feldner. That was a great talk, and I appreciate you mentioning Sinobiological. We do have a partnership with Dr. Feldner. If you would like to see a similar multiplexed array available for the research market, please log on to the Sino website. It's called Sinomune. We've gotten a lot of excellent questions for your talk in relation to your talk. They're mostly technical, so I'll just start with the first one. Your in vitro transcription and translation method for printing the arrays, one user is concerned that the proteins may not represent a native confirmation or native post-translational modification. Do you view this as a big problem? Yeah, what we noticed was that we were able to detect thousands of antibodies in people who were infected with malaria. Uh, so at least uh, for its ability to uh, detect antibodies that were uh, falciparum specific, they certainly do that. Uh, the question of whether they're whether they're detecting all of the antibodies because of some uh, conformational limitation is, is, is kind of an open question. But now uh, what we're doing uh, with, uh, with laboratories like the Sino group, uh, those proteins are made in mammalian cells and they're glycosylated and they're you know, uh, characterized in a more uh, traditional, traditional way. Great. And I'm getting a number of questions on cross-reactivity, and your systems really seem to be superior to many other systems which tend to detect non-COVID-19-related antigens. So the question is, how is it that your system results in a very low cross-reactivity with those while, while others seem to have that problem? Our conclusion is that there's very little background cross-reactivity against the novel coronavirus antigens. Uh, certainly compared to the, the, the herd immunity that we see uh, with the, the common um, infections uh, that are, are you know, usually in, uh, involved in seasonal influenza and other kinds of flu. Um, that doesn't mean that there isn't some level of cross-reactivity occurring. It's just very, very low because you can, you can compare it to the background reactivity that we have uh, against the, the uh, more common respiratory infections. Person asked very quickly, what's the lower limit of detection for your arrays? I guess maybe in picograms per mil, do you know? We can do, uh, uh, when we have monoclonal antibodies, we can uh, do titrations and uh, measure the dissociation constant. And so that requires us to titrate out below 10 to the minus ninth molar. So the detection uh, sensitivity uh, for measuring these antibodies is well below 10 to the minus ninth molar. With that, what I would like to mention is any other questions related, if you could type it in, if the attendees could type it into the chat box, we'll get a printout of these and we'll forward these um, to our speakers today and, and get some responses. And now I think it's time to close the meeting. So first I'd like to thank the speakers, Dr. Bush, Dr. Korosh, and Dr. Feldner. We really appreciate your time today. This has been incredibly valuable for all of us. I want to thank all the attendees and registrants. We had a very good attendance today, and specifically Cambridge Health Tech Institute and Elizabeth Lamb for hosting this webinar. We appreciate your efforts, and specifically my employer, Sino Biological, for sponsoring it, and also my good friend and colleague, Dr. Jen Liu, who helped coordinate this as well. She's in our marketing department. And so with that, I feel like this was a big success, and we'll sign off and say thanks again to everybody. Enjoy. Bye.